We have had the pleasure of having Victoria Hartke uh, present to us at the National Academy of Sciences back in the old days when we could get together in person. Victoria is the act is she's now the acting principal uh, deputy director at the uh, Department of State Overseas Buildings Operations. And uh, joining her is uh, Tracy Thomas, who is the Managing Director for Construction Facility and Security Management. So thank you, Victoria and uh, Tracy, for joining us. And thanks, Mike, for inviting us back. Um, you know, I it's hard for me to believe it's been uh, since uh, National Academy of Sciences that I've uh, been able to, to come and, and speak with the group. And I'm incredibly pleased to be joined by my colleague and peer, Tracy Thomas, this morning. Um, and and I, I was thinking about some of the comments that Deb and uh, Keith made about when you, when you think about how much work there is to go, it can sort of feel, you know, maybe like you're walking in sand or maybe you're walking in mud, but then having an opportunity to have reviewed and, and sort of listened to and, and seen the slides that Tracy was putting together, I really do feel like we're making some progress, although some of the same themes, um, you know, sort of funding, policy, people, IT, you know, the things that, that Deb mentioned, they're, they're the same. Um, you know, we, we face the same challenges regardless of scale of the portfolio. But um, anyway, let me just let me just jump in a little bit. I'm going to do a couple of slides and then I'll turn it over to Tracy, who's the, the meat and potatoes this morning. Um, as Mike said, I'm Victoria Hartke. I'm the acting principal deputy director here at the Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations. Um, been working in this space um, from, oh my, oh my gosh, from when we started several years ago working on, on redesign at the Department of State and really thinking about asset management in a new way and then bringing that back to OBO from sort of the department effort into what we'd been calling OBO transformation. Um, and, uh, and so this is a bit of our journey, a bit of our roadmap. And I think uh, you'll hopefully you'll see some of the progress we've made as, as Tracy outlines it today. This is what we'll be going through a little bit about the global footprint, um, speaking about uh, maintenance and repair best practices for our global portfolio, uh, facilities staffing, um, you know, H, you know, uh, human resources and, and the people question. You saw a lot of questions and comments about that in the chat. Definitely an area that uh, we're, we're paying quite a bit of attention to. Uh, Tracy's going to do a deep dive into a case study on the uh, newly uh, christened embassy in Maputo, um, for which Tracy was uh, was on hand to, for the dedication. Uh, looking at technology, um, and and I think this again sort of shadows some of the the, the things that Deb said, some of the issues. You know, um, looking at industry, seeing what industry is doing, how can we match that? Um, and then how can we put that into practice and, and you know, sort of keep looking ahead to what's coming uh, and, then, and, then we'll be, uh, and then we'll be offering some conclusions. So just to, a bit uh, about the uh, Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations, which we either call OBO or OBO. So we might, you might hear us referring to it uh, e either way, but basically we're responsible for direct directing the Worldwide Overseas Building Program. And uh, it's not just building, but it's, it's the entirety of that portfolio asset management for the Department of State um, and for all the uh, tenant agencies that serve overseas under Chief of Mission Authority. Um, and, and some of the uh, you know, things that you might not know about, not only are we doing our uh, office facilities, but any number of functional facilities, warehouses, other support buildings, and then residential. So we're responsible for the full gamut um, of, of asset types, asset classes overseas. Um, and we're, we're looking more and more, I think one of the things that Deb mentioned was, was funding, and we are looking more and more as our funding um, we're having to look more closely at stewardship. So we're, we're looking at prioritization. So, and we're trying to figure out how do you do that across these different types of asset classes. So for example, how do you decide whether a compound security upgrade outweighs uh, or is, is more valuable than um, an ADA uh, or an ABA uh, upgrade to a representational facility like an ambassador's residence? Uh, the, the, it probably you know, goes without saying that the, that the real purpose for these facilities 
are for diplomacy. They underpin the buildings themselves, underpin the relationships um, across, uh, across communities, across nations, uh, across so, so many, you know, building bit bridges across these divides. Um, one of the stories that I, I just love was when our, uh, our new director, Ambassador William Mosier, who has returned to OBO after serving as the ambassador to Kazakhstan, um, he was describing for us not too long ago um, when he dedicated the new embassy compound in uh, Enjamina, which is in Chad. And, and it was a beautiful building and we had um, an amazing design and we had the best in American architecture and, and design and construction execution and, and, and management. Uh, and, and there was so many, you know, we used aesthetics and we pulled from the local community. Um, and instead of, or I should say, you know, maybe the highlight for so many people was not the building or the building features, but was art. It was a, a sculpture of a camel in the lobby. And so many people were, at, you know, at that building dedication were taking pictures. And so it really emphasizes um, the cultural diplomacy um, and that the buildings are so, you know, provide really so much more uh, than just buildings. Now it is, it's absolutely, you know, the bottom line here, we want our facilities, we need our facilities, we're dedicated to having our facilities be safe, secure, uh, resilient, technologically innovative and sustainable. And that's consistent um, with uh, administration priorities, especially uh, on climate and, um, and greening. Next slide, please. And really this is, uh, you know, the, the mission, I'm not gonna read these to you because I've sort of already covered them a little bit, but, but these three lenses, security, resilience, and stewardship, um, I would say that these are the types of filters that we bring to so many decisions, uh, the priorities that we have to make when we're uh, looking at, at making budget decisions and what to put forward and, and what to, to sort of maybe uh, to, to hold back. Um, with security being, um, a primary driver. And one of the things we're trying to do is look a little bit more um, broadly at the sort of risk management and trying to sort of assess, can we deliver what we need to deliver for the American people to, to foster diplomacy? Should we continue to develop it the way we have been or are changes needed? And I think Deb mentioned sort of legislative change and that's something that's on our, you know, sort of on our, our horizon as well. Um, resilience, continuing to look at the impact of climate inundation, looking at making decisions um, with some of these uh, with some of these factors in mind uh, more and more as we're looking at tsunami studies and other things to try to make sure that when, when we're planning, we're making really good decisions. And then stewardship, I mean, for, for me, I come from a background um, in, in real estate and there's always economics and it's very hard to sort of toggle between economics and diplomacy sort of and what's the value and is it ROI uh, or is it you know are there other broader sort of reciprocal political needs but um, but this is these are lenses that we apply to to absolutely everything uh, that we're doing next slide please so before uh, before I uh, turn the microphone over to Tracy Thomas I wanted to just to tell you a little bit about her um, you've probably uh, seen a bio or can see a bio but um, she has been our uh, managing director for construction facility security management for a couple of years now. She was just inducted into the Missouri University of Science and Technologies Academy of Civil Engineers. She is at the forefront um, of so much of our work on facility management. And I think, um, uh, I think there was a question about Builder and I'm hoping that Tracy's gonna get into that throughout her presentation, but um, she's got so much to share today. So grateful to be sharing the, uh, the, the platform and the, and the uh, podium with her. And Tracy, I will uh, hand it over to you. Very good. Uh, thank you, Victoria. And thank you to everyone participating today in the Asset Leadership Network. We do have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving, but I'll, I'll drop some uh, breadcrumbs along the way if we want to invite topics of interest for further discussion, or we can, we can answer some questions as we go. So the table of contents that Victoria went through, I'll be following that and going from there. So we'll start out with high-level budgets. You can see uh, for the, for the uh, uh, immediate past and current Fiscal years, 3.4 and 3.9 billion dollars. That funding level has been consistent for for several years, 
and a big part of the focus of spending on that is is new construction. I'll talk about that only a little bit this morning. The amount of money that we've been spending on maintenance and repair has has been fairly stable around 400 million. So if you do the math, it's just over 10%, but it's not budgeted on a percentage basis. If our if our capital budgets go up, uh, repair and maintenance tends to to stay the same. And so we need some models to help us evaluate how do we need to start making a shift in these budgets to uh, to protect our our investments and with that let's uh, let's go to the next slide i mentioned our our construction budget is is still very very large we call this our active investment you can see where we are worldwide the the, the icons there indicate capital construction, our new embassies, our new consulates, et cetera. We also are doing a large number of lease fit outs and rehabs. I mentioned the 400 million, they, they go into that, that portion of the budget. Security is one of our driving factors. So compound security upgrades are, are always happening. It seems like we never get them done because we're constantly reviewing our security standards. We also do residential work for our marine detachments and some other things. The other thing I wanna highlight on this slide, just to kind of, just to give the geography, I'll be talking more about this later, that's our overseas regional support centers. We are presently in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, that's supporting everything in our Western Hemisphere operations. We are in Cape Town, South, South Africa, covering the continent of Africa with a support hub up in Abidjan. And we are we're just staffing both of those places. That's a very successful model. We have previously been in Frankfurt, Germany. I still there. Nice team. If you've been reading the news about some diplomatic stressors over in Moscow, some of that's being supported out of Frankfurt. Frankfurt is also supporting everything we're doing in uh, Near East, South Central Asia to include Kabul and, and Baghdad. It's a very, very active group. And we are also to the point of opening up a support center over in Guam to support our operations in Micronesia. We'll look to open a center in East Asia Pacific soon. Haven't got that one located, uh, but this is a very important part of our customer service. We'll see it again later. So I wanted to highlight those on the map. Let's go to the next. We'll go very quickly on the program. Where, where do we spend that kind of budget? We have $18 billion currently under construction on 55 active projects around the world. We have 850 million on those renovations. Again, it's a much smaller portion of the budget. We have to be very careful how we prioritize and plan those projects. I mentioned compound security upgrades. You can see there uh, over, over 25 of those going. Our minor construction and improvements, we call that our MCI funding. You, you can kind of look at the differences there. Over 250 of those projects for a smaller budget, 350 million compared to our major renovation. Our MCI projects are, are generally implemented at the local level at post through a facility manager. And you can see our leasing figures there. Let's go to the next. What I wanted to do at this point, we're still under the broad topic of our of our global footprint. And I wanted to take some of that that global presence and look and see what we're doing very much uh, at, at the local level. This example happened. We were wanting to collect data on quality of life. What do residents think about where they live? Victoria mentioned we have completely robust office buildings overseas, but we're also housing the entire diplomatic community and their families. And so they live in houses. And so we were collecting data on the quality of life and putting that in a dashboard view so that posts could see at a high level or a low level what people were saying about life safety, security, comforts, accessibility. And then a very interesting nexus happened with Geospatial Data Day. And that was a proud moment when I could say that day and understood what it meant. And we were starting to see 
how can our data at a home, a specific residential location, could, there were other things happening in the department around GIS. And so we teamed up with the Center for Analytics over at MSS, and we have a number of our OBO staff working on some of these GIS solutions. To the point now that if you had a lease, legal descriptions for property, we can pin that right into this uh, new app that we call the GIS Housing Network, our HNET dashboard. So this is continuing, continuing to develop as we identify things that would be helpful to know. We pin it right to the resident. So you can see an entire global view, but you can also drill right down to what is the resident's satisfaction, what are the fire and life, fire and life safety needs, et cetera. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, again, this is just showing uh, how we're capturing the, the data on the quality of life survey. So, so it's very exciting. I, I wanted to integrate some data discussion uh, as we go forward. And also want to give a shout out to next week, November 17th is GIS Day for all of you that might want to be celebrating that. And I think, let's see, that, that's actually the end of this, this section. Again, we went over the kind of the global view, looked at some data applications. So we can ask for general uh, topics to discuss later or take any higher level questions at this point, if, if you like. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like you uh, to thank you for uh, pointing out the uh, uh, GIS day next week. And in an earlier presentation uh, in the series, it was pointed out uh, by Kimono Numa that the biggest asset that has imp impacted the world is our uh, Department of Defense global information system, satellites, and the entire apparatus. And that when President Reagan made that information available to everyone in the world to uh, help prevent things like the uh, Korean airline that got shot down uh, by Russian missiles, that is what cha started changing what we are trying to catch up with now. And Admiral Allen pointed out that uh, uh, the defense services have been operating in this mission focused way for many years. Um, and now we're starting to uh, get the defense uh, dividend of, of this in our uh, civilian agencies. Oh, it's been there, but it's really expanding now and, and drilling down into the uh, uh, facilities and real estate section. So thank you. Right. Uh, you're, you're welcome. And then uh, your last slide, when you were pointing out the quality of life, that's, uh, that's great that you do that. Of course, you have to uh, assess that because of your mission and you're serving the diplomats and their families and, you know, all the staff um, in foreign countries. That's a great um, concept to be using or other agencies and other people to think about what is the quality of life and measure the quality of life of the people they're serving. So that's good also. Okay, uh, th thank you. We'll stay on this slide for a second. I want, I want to highlight, make a transition here and what, what we're talking about. In 2014, GAO reviewed practices of five federal agencies related to their deferred maintenance and repair backlog and the State Department was not one of those agencies. The re that report identified nine leading practices for maintenance and repair of federal real property. Now, just recently, GAO published a report specific to the State Department in our overseas maintenance and, and repair backlog. How are we doing? They made some recommendations and and that audit was done very much in partnership between GAO and OBO. It wasn't, it wasn't really adversarial. We looked together at what we're doing, what we could do better, document what we're doing. It was out of that that we were documenting our sustainment, restoration and modernization practices that, that we're still developing. And so, so through that lens, we'll, we'll move into this section on federal real property maintenance and repair best practices. So let's go to the next, and I'm still going to build a bridge between these two sections. You can see at, at the top of this slide sort of a more about our uh, global footprint by the numbers. We're in over 290 locations. Uh, 
the portfolio valued at $71 billion. Uh, as Victoria was talking about art, a significant portion of our por portfolio is in culturally significant properties and, and of, course our, of course, our art inventory as well. So that's uh, that captures kind of the, also the breadth. It's also offices and residential, as I mentioned before. A, a few years ago, we took our functional bureau strategy and, and ran these initiatives. They are still our areas of focus. We're going to maintain these through our leadership transition with Ambassador Moser in the seat as the director. And some of the things I was just talking about, the uh, HNAT, that falls under our diplomatic residential program, the third one over there on the right. The quality of life survey was done uh, and, and as part of that uh, DRP. Victoria mentioned some of the funding challenges. So all of that's being handled under that area of focus. Going below there, data management and analytics, of course, you already you already saw that as well in some of the HNET and some of our partnership with Center for Analytics. So that underpins a great deal of what we're doing. As data becomes available, as we can integrate it, analyze it, respond to it, it's a super exciting time to be uh, to be in this line of work. Talent management is vital to what we do as well. We're going to talk some about that in a, in a previous section of this presentation. Going back to the top, Embassy After Next is the name of our project delivery. Uh, initiatives. We're not going to be looking at that very much today, but we're going to focus a great deal of what we're doing on facility maintenance and upkeep. That's the second area of focus over there. As we've been developing policies around sustainment restoration modernization and partnership with GAO, as I mentioned, identifying the people side of things, there's just a ton of activity going on here, and I'm happy to be leading that. So let's go to the next. Okay, I'm, I'm not one to read words on a slide. Uh, this one I, I will look into, however. I mentioned GAO identified nine leading practices. These five, we, we were given a, a star on our report card that in fact, we are, we are following these things. Have we established clear maintenance and repair investment objectives? It says, yes, we, we have those objectives. We sort of know how to set priorities. We do have a budget. We do. We do plan that work. It's implemented some of it through headquarters and some of it locally. Performance goals, baselines, and measures. They say yes. We're, we're following this one. That it's uh, that's fairly effective in in the performance of our facility management. Identify primary methods to deliver. And so so yes, we have delivery models, MCI, maintenance and repair, uh, various teams that help set those priorities. Can we improve them? Yes, we are and we will, but, but the, the frameworks are in place. Number four, aligning property portfolios with mission needs, et cetera. Yes, we're doing that. We identify mission needs, we respond to it, we decommission facilities, et cetera. And actually our, uh, the value of our uh, global footprint, I mean, it's changing all the time with, with things coming online and th things going out. So, so we do that. Number five, identify risk proposed by lack of timely investment. And, and I think a lot of what we do is, is around specifically risk. Uh, Victoria mentioned cross-program prioritization. How, how do you, uh, we're working on this right now. We, this is a kind of a fairly new initiative. A lot of what we've done has, is responding to security needs, but there are other needs around climate security and resilience, and accessibility and, and, and other things that, that we're gonna be looking at. It, again, it's exciting to be able to collect the data so we can analyze it and set priorities across all everything that we're doing. So let's go to the next. It's a little bit deeper dive. Now on the left, you have all of, all of the nine practices. We already covered the top five. We, are, we, we, we have those embedded into our DNA, need to improve, but but we're doing those. GAO identified six, seven, and eight. We've started some things. We're not there yet. And number nine around predicting outcomes. We're not there yet. We, we've got some ideas. We've got some notions. And so we need to, we need to go in that direction. Number six, 
identify types of facilities that are mission critical to target investments. This was a great recommendation by the GAO. Uh, l let us just say in their report, they have summarized correctly that we calculated deferred maintenance and base uh, and uh, deferred, <laughs> I'm talking too fast, <laughs> deferred maintenance backlog based on a calculation of facility condition index, FCI. We took a measurement of 70 across the board. If you're above 70, you're fair. If you're below 70, you're poor. And everything that was poor got calculated into the, into the value that they reported of $3 billion. That's what we calculated. Is it really $3 billion? Or there's some things that are fair that in fact need some attention because fair isn't good enough. How are we calculating that FCI? We need to improve that. We're going to talk about that as we go here. But I think, to me, a really, a really telling part about this recommendation was on criticality. Is it criticality of the post in a particular country? That can be critical. Is it criticality of a building on a compound? Because some are more critical than others. Or even at that, some spaces in a particular building are more critical. So we need to be looking at the systems. We need to be able to tag the inventory and track operations of equipment in spaces that are critical inside of a building on a compound in a country. And so, so tackling number six will, will look something like that. Number seven, conduct condition assessments as a basis for establishing funding requirements. And we'll spend a lot more time talking about that. We are doing what we call facility performance evaluations, which is a data validation effort against our computerized maintenance management system, our CMMS. So we'll, we'll spend more time talking about that, how we're improving that. Structure budgets to identify the funding allotted for M&R and address any DM backlog. When I started with the budget slide, it's not realistic to think that we're going to keep spending like we are in capital construction. And hey, can I have some more for deferred maintenance and backlog? They, our stakeholders in Congress have told us we need to start looking at what's, what's the appropriate mix to continue our capital investment, but also preserve and enhance our, our investment through stewardship by taking care of our maintenance and repair. So, so we're going to be looking at that. And number nine, we, we've said that we haven't really started this, but I, I, I think our minds are going there, but we don't have the data tools in place on, on predictive uh, outcomes, but we'll, we'll be looking at it as we go in the presentation. So let's go to the next one. This looks like, uh, ne next slide. This looks like, uh, like more complicated, deeper dives still. The nine leading practices are the same ones there highlighted in, in the yellow dots. We align them a little bit more to how does OBO deliver? And so they are aligned with where we are in our asset life cycle phases. You can see through strategic planning, design development, execution, construction, operation, maintenance. So, so we've aligned them that way and then further aligned them over to the right with the ISO 55000. We're not adopting it completely. We're finding the pieces and parts that line up with where we need to go, more, what works best for us. So let's go to the next slide. So I mentioned uh, number seven was about conducting condition assessments. We'll, we'll take a little bit of a deeper look at this. We collect data on all of the equipment. At the end of a brand new construction project, we, we populate a computerized maintenance management system, CMMS, that we call GMMS, which is a customized software piece. And that, that software and that customized software is incredible and we've made a lot of improvements on it in recent years. But I, I can imagine that the quality of that data begins to migrate with time. Was it really updated correctly? Uh, one thing I didn't say before that I intended to, we, we, at headquarters, we look at our global footprint but all of our maintenance is done locally. It's, it's decentralized in that way. We have oversight by all means of the programs, but the facility manager is an asset at the embassy and everything that that, that individual does 
in facility management is done under under that person's authority. So some, sometimes that's better than others, I can say it that way. So what I really like about the facility performance evaluation is a data validation tool. And we'll have a feedback loop from the data that comes out of Builder. This is where the Builder answer comes in. We are, we have adopted Builder. And when data comes out of it, it will check the data that's in our GMMS system so that we've got a, a feedback loop on that. The, let's look at the other information here. The, the other thing that we've done is these key performance indicators. Again, we, we've been in partnership with GAO and the development of some of these things. And it was important that we had key performance indicators to measure how we're doing. This is another uh, graphic of data collection. And we, we do annual benchmarking and the measurement allows the, the things listed there, the building condition index, facility conditions needs index, Facility management profile, I want to talk about just for a second. That's not the quality of the individual. That's the, the business environment, the supply chain, how close is regional maintenance. It's different if you're in Europe and if you're in on the continent of Africa, for example. So it's, it's, that, it's that kind of a measure because every location isn't the same and the responsiveness isn't the same and the challenges are not the same. So the number three uh, captures that. Then you've got your maintenance cost and, and energy use. And so we, we wanna capture these in our benchmark uh, surveys and there, the transparency is there. You can get to this data at any time. There still may be questions about some of the quality of the data, but the framework is there. And as we go forward, we'll, we'll be increasing on the quality. Let's see if I have anything else to say about this. No, that, that's good. Let's go to the next slide. We are starting to implement practices on design for maintainability. That includes, uh, that includes a number of things. A simple one is if the facility manager is going to be successful with, with staff and shops and whatnot, we are a user of a facility. So we want to make sure that our user needs are being captured in, in the space requirement plan. So whatever shops that we need to be a successful user. I was the project director in Islamabad, Pakistan, and one of my favorite things to show during a tour was the building automation system control room. And this, this room was incredible with the monitors and everything that, that those super qualified trained individuals were doing to run our building automation system over there. That doesn't come by accident. You can't get to the end of a project and then throw that in a janitor's closet. It's got to be planned in. So, so we're doing that. So that, that's not specific design for maintainability, but that's setting us up for success for our facility managers. Another part of it is selecting the right kind of equipment for the environment and the business climate. I mentioned a minute ago, like some supplies and equipment are available locally, uh, regionally, and some, some of them are not. So how do you select the right equipment that can, in fact, be uh, maintained, repaired, and get the parts you need. That's important to put that right in the design. But the other part is what we're seeing on this slide, that total cost of facility ownership should be considered as a design variable. You can predict the O&M cost through the life of the project, and you ought to be able to tell when that equipment might need major replacement or something. So that's what we're depicting in this slide here, and we're looking for this kind of data to be analyzed during design development of a project. And that's depicted on the next slide. So this is the, the Bangkok uh, new office annex. And, and, and this, is, this is kind of notional. I'm not sure that we're actually here yet on every design. We're putting in the two, we're writing that into our design deliverables right now. That if you have multiple concepts, this is how we do design development, multiple concepts responding to the environment, the culture, political tones, et cetera, how, how you go through and select a design in the concept phase. But we want total cost of facility ownership to also be a part of that. So we're asking for this as a deliverable that each concept, you can see what the, what total cost of facility ownership is. It might not be the, the, the driving decision maker, or it might be, but it still needs to be on the table. We need to be able to consider it. 
So that is the end of this section, I believe. So again, if you want to drop some comments in or question or, or look at it, that's, that's kind of the process side. Happy to have further conversation about it uh, now at a high level or later, but that, that, that's what I put together to, to attack process. Well, there's a, a couple questions uh, for sure about that, especially uh, uh, the total cost of ownership. Um, that is so important. And the fact that you're doing that as part of your planning process, and like you said, it may not be the deciding factor, but it certainly could be a consideration. Uh, that's just starting to be implemented in uh, policy, such as the city of Portland has an asset management policy that says total cost of ownership has to be part of your asset management decision-making. What are, what went into helping you establish what those total costs are? I'm going to say I'm not even sure. It's certainly the, the energy cost. We do want to predict that. Mm -hmm. And when we get into the, the case study on the U.S. Embassy in, in Maputo, we'll see a, an, an incredible facade design but the cost of re replacement and repair of that facade also went into it. So, so we look specifically at some of our security products, our facades, major equipment and roofing, and we try to predict when those will need to be replaced based on the environment and everything else, and then calculate, calculate those costs. It looks something like that. Okay. Um, there is an organization called uh, APA that came out of the university uh, planning uh, and they're, they're developing a total cost of ownership standard. Um, we can uh, share that with everyone on the call also. And then- Thank uh, you, that's great. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, now we, we wanna move to the people side. Similar to the GAO audit to review operations and maintenance with respect to funding, we are just now starting a GAO audit related to uh, the human capital side. It, we've just, we just did the kickoff. We also want it to be a partnership for them to see where's our needs? How do you decide what you need? How do you, how do you train people? Where's the constraints? Yeah, I, I stay, stay where you were, uh, Lauren. Yeah, backward, backward. There you go, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so we're looking forward to working with, with GAO on, on the human capital audit. It's just kicking off right now. This is the only slide I have for, for, for the people side of things. And so we'll, we'll talk through a few points. Um, we have, uh, we mentioned 290 facilities overseas. Does every one of them have a full-time uh, US direct hire foreign service facility manager? No, we have 237 authorized positions. You can see that I'm on the upper left corner there. Um, I, I love that recently our Global talent management has, has, they're very strongly supporting a training float, another kind of float that we don't just hire to our numbers, we can actually hire over that. This is continues to be in a, in a skill code deficit for us. We have 201 in positions and, and 18 people either out of cone means they're on uh, filling another assignment, another management position, maybe they're on a long term training detail, that kind of thing. The recruiting numbers are on the bottom left. I won't go into that so much. Where it says local resources in the top middle, if we don't have a US direct hire foreign service facility manager, in some cases we have a locally engaged facility manager. And some of these staff are extremely talented and many of them have been mentored by uh, direct hire uh, foreign foreign service people, very, very talented. Another program that we're really promoting and finding good success is called our EPAPS. That's an expanded professional associates program. And NBC's overseas, uh, it, it's very important for families that eligible family members can have other employment. And the expanded professional associates program takes advantage of those people with professional certs and they're they're hired to actually fill that function. Now, it, it may seem fairly narrow. How, how often do you have someone with facility management background as a family member? Um, but we do have some, we have a 25 
active. The, the other advantage of that, those are centrally funded. They're not funded from post. Uh, so, so when we have those authorized, we actively uh, try to fill them. We also support what we're doing overseas through temporary duty assignments you can see there. The other two programs I want to highlight are our IMAP technicians, International Maintenance Assistance Program, I think that stands for. And so these are specialty technicians, most of them with a security clearance, and we deploy them worldwide to go into some of those critical areas where you need a clearance to get to where you're going. And it's it's very difficult to manage that just locally. So we have a team of people that were ready to deploy around the world. They're part of the success story of what happened during COVID-19 when facilities still had to be operated. We still needed people going overseas. And rather than bring these teams back to the U.S. where possibly they couldn't travel again, we kept them forward deployed and able to respond immediately. We had some significant power outages and problems like that. And it was these teams able to do some emergency response. And then in the upper right hand corner, there's again our overseas regional support centers. These are structured so that they are an extension of OBO headquarters. So it is important for us to manage and understand what's controlled locally at an embassy and what's controlled by headquarters. And the overseas regional support centers are an extension of, of what we're doing. Again, closer deployed to the missions overseas. They have specialty trades, architects. They can stock some equipment, spare parts, that kind of thing. So that's also a very important part of supporting our folks. So I, I won't say much more than that except for, actually, I will say one other thing. So wh wh where, where are we going? Is 237 authorized positions, is that the right number? Some embassies have multiple U.S. direct hires. Some have none. What does headquarters staff need to look like to support this kind of a global footprint? We're, we're functioning, and I think we're functioning successfully, but we can always do better. So we, we do have studies ongoing as to what does a, a better staffing model look like, not just for FAC inside of OBO, but how do we support all of OBO and how does OBO do this holistically? And I call that the FAC of the future. So, so we're, we're looking at that. Uh, what is a more ideal staffing model? I, I, I don't want to assume just because we got here that that was exactly the right when it's successful. We want to make sure we got the right model. So that, that's what I have on the people side. Again, can, can entertain some questions on that or keep going in the interest of time. Maybe we'll just keep going to, to Maputo. So what I wanna do and call this a case study and you can go to the next slide, Lauren. We'll, give you a peek inside this building through through the amazement of photos and videos and that kind of thing. I want to look at the design of it. It was a tremendous tremendous success in in construction and teamwork with our facility management transition. Uh, but also look at how can we take some of that design for maintainability? How have we implemented that here and what can we do going forward? So the, the design itself it is it's incredible. This is a uh, it's a bespoke design. There's not much really standard about it. It made use of a locally harvested Mozambican hardwood called panga panga. We really wanted to make sure in sourcing of that we use sustainable sources. The region of the country where it came from underwent some really uh, severe flooding in the course of the of the construction and so how do you how do you still supply what you need to keep it in a sustainable way and respect the economic conditions that were deteriorating during the flooding time i think that we, we manage that well we will see it in the photo so i i won't maybe i won't say more of it then uh, I'll, I'll show you the panga panga when we get to the photos this facility is located right next to the ocean, so there were some sensitivities about what, what do we do with our uh, stormwater runoff and that kind of thing. And the, the obvious from the photo, I think, is the, the facade. I think if facility managers uh, graded this, they, they probably wouldn't like it. <laughs> it's gonna be difficult, but it really is beautiful and it respects the local culture. Uh, there's a 
popular wood sculpture there referred to as Makunde. And so these fins that were put out there uh, respect that. I also love the story of how they came together. It was a partnership between and some Italian craftsmen, some Turkish suppliers, and of course the, the architects to, to make these fins so that they, they were precast and shipped in. They have a, an appearance that looks different in the light because of the way that the metal shavings are embedded into the concrete. So it's just, it's just fantastic design and architecture and it was implemented in a fantastic way. And although our, my facility management colleagues are gonna have some trouble probably with some of the windows and stuff like that, as, as we looked at design for maintainability, we actually predicted what this is going to look like when we have to get to, to the facade replacement. Let's go to the next slide. So our, our presently going forward, we want to look at 50 year life cycles, but this was kind of prototypical just getting started. We looked at a 40 year life cycle. And this is this is a graph. It's this is real data from from Aputo looking at each of the buildings on campus. You can see the the red line is the chancery. That's what we call our NOB new office building, and it's uh, uh, buying away, of course, the largest expenses. But you can see the rest there through buildings. And then we drilled down on the next slide, in just into the into the new office building. That's the chancery, and this one goes into the shell the interiors, the services, equipment, furnishings. And guess what? You get out there about 30 years in that big red line that says we're going to have to pay attention to the facade. That doesn't make it a bad design. It doesn't make it a wrong decision. It just means it needs to mean we know this. So when it gets there, we're going to have to pay attention to it. Uh, the, the green lines there, interiors and, and et cetera. So, so we could look at that, but we, we actually studied this in a real way from Maputo. And to me, it's a model that we should be using on all of our projects going forward. On the next slide, th this graphic is, is, is not Maputo, but I, I still liked the way it looked. We require a facade maintenance report to come in as a design deliverable. How are you going to maintain it? It's not just things like the fins and we have those kind of facades uh, a diagrid went up in Dahran in Saudi Arabia, and we, we have other fancy facades going in. How do those have to be maintained? But it's extremely important. How are we going to be able to uh, change out windows? Windows have to get uh, upgraded regularly, and if we ever get attacked or stray bullets do happen from time to time, you got to be able to replace the windows. So now we, we don't just assume that this is going to get worked out in the field later. We actually look at uh, where, where is the equipment going to sit up? How, how are we going to get this done? So that's what this is depicting on this slide. And that's most of the design comments. Let's, let's go to the next. So I recently had the, the privilege to represent the State Department in dedicating this facility. And so um, that gives new meaning to the word headshot. And I didn't get the cue to look at the camera. That's me over on the left. And the delivery of this facility also during COVID-19 was something incredible. Uh, we won't talk about it much, but for for that to happen and impact the world, and, and we kept going, and there were challenges. I already mentioned the flooding in Mozambique. There were visa challenges in Mozambique. We could not get all of our people in and out expeditiously. There was some internal political fighting at the local government as to who got to make the decisions about who came into the country, so it was extremely difficult. So to actually get this done and cut the ribbon in the middle of COVID-19 was really something incredible. Let's go to the next slide. This is a, a full image of the compound. I'm gonna give you a bit of a photo tour. And Lauren, is this the one where the video is? I can't remember where the video is. This is the video, okay, everybody watch. You can see it on the ocean, that's exactly as it's situated. Those are the shops and the warehouse uh, in the foreground. The marine house is the beige, the short beige colored building. This project has a parking garage. Uh, it's got solar panels on it. You can see it coming on the, on the left. Actually, it's not solar panels. In a moment, we're gonna go inside the building. I love the design feature. When you go in the front door, 
you see the Panga Panga hardwood, you're on the first level. There's the grand staircase. And when you're on the second level, I don't know if we'll see it on the video, you get to a cafeteria area and it's on the second floor and you're back to the Panga Panga. You start to see it over there on the left. There's an incredible art program in this facility as well. It highlights both American and, and local artists. Okay, I haven't seen that yet. There's, there's the Panga Panga on the second level. And I'm not sure we're going to get up to the third level. I guess we're getting to the third level. There's an out, there's an outdoor balcony on the third level, and guess what it has in it? Panga Panga. And so, if if you're standing in one place to the other, it kind of makes this light shaft through the, through the entire building. Of you, you can always see the the Panga Panga, and to me that that sets a respectful cultural message inside of an American office building. Um, That is the view out to the ocean when you're inside. Okay, yeah, so that, that was the end of the video tour. We'll just uh, fly through some, some shots here. This is a close-up of the facade. You, can't, you can kind of tell the metal shavings are in there. It reflects the light in a certain way, the way that the metal shavings were included. Let's go to the next. There's the upper panga panga on, on the balcony. Again, if you're there, you can look all the way down to the first floor and see the light shaft coming through there. Next. Uh, front entrance again. There's the outdoor seating on the balcony. Next. You can see some of the artwork. Interior space is just beautiful. Next. More of the artwork. Next. There, there it is on the outside again. Let's stay here for one second and check, catch up with my notes. So what are we going to do going forward on, on uh, Maputo? I mean, the aim is this, this is a beautiful facility, and we want it to continue looking like this. It can continue looking like this with the right, uh, the right facility maintenance team on the ground. The GMMS, our government maintenance management system, was fully populated at, at the transition from construction to operations. But we're going to go ahead and baseline this with a facility performance evaluation. I, I, we're trying to get that scheduled actually this calendar year. As I mentioned, that becomes the data validation. You've got everything in the GMMS. We want to capture it in Builder. We also want to barcode all of our equipment over here. Barcoding equipment uh, is is very common in our embassies overseas for our warehouse staff when things come into the building everything is barcoded and tracked for inventory control it's very important but we don't barcode our major equipment or even minor equipment so this doesn't make a lot of sense so we're going to barcode the equipment so that in future again making use of technology you may have a uh, ipad scan the barcode and then a facility manager, someone on the team, this is the annual survey, they can say, yes, this is still in top running condition. No, it's not. It's now you're collecting data that validates what's in your government maintenance management system. When you get that data, now you can look at total cost of facility ownership and you can review it against what you predicted. The prediction at design doesn't need to be one number that you never look at again. You validate it. You adjust it, you change it, you respond to it. So at that point, you ought to be able to understand how much money you're going to 
you're going to spend for maintenance and repair. We saw that on the graph earlier. The people that are developing these programs for us like to use the word unconstrained budget. And of course, our finance people shudder at that as well as I do. To not have deferred maintenance and repair means that you spend the money when you need to. But if you don't have the budget, if you're collecting the data and analyzing it, then you can prioritize and make decisions on knowing if you don't spend money on something, maybe it's not going to be in a good condition, maybe it might be fair. And you can set those standards, what, what makes it poor, what makes it fair, what makes it, makes it acceptable, and you spend your money appropriately. So that we, we, we want to go that way. If you can do that on one project, then you could overlay the entire portfolio and, 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 and uh, look at it from that standpoint. That gives you the data to look back at your, at your budget, what you need to be spending on maintenance versus, versus capital investment. Something that, that we've, we've done this year, we're back into the phase the federal government is or the State Department is on our functional bureau strategy. And for years, we have measured our success on the number of people in the diplomatic community that we move into safe, secure, resilient functional facilities. And I think that's extremely important. But I'm not sure it's capturing the whole story. So this year, we're looking at using our facility condition index actually as our measure of success. And that captures construction. So for example, the facility that the mission was in Maputo was a series of houses and, and buildings and not in very good shape. And that's in an environment with deteriorating, deteriorating security conditions in Mozambique. And it had an FCI of something less than 70, I believe. And now it has an FCI, we hope somewhere uh, close to 100. So even the capital security investment moves the needle on FCI. So, it, so FCI is a valid measurement across the board. And if you collect in the data, you can also start to see where it makes sense to continue to make capital, capital construction investment versus a, a major rehab to, to come out with, a, with an FCI outcome. So that's where we wanna go with all of the data and look at it globally. A couple of things on, on what, how are we going to set ourselves up for success here? I already mentioned ORSC, Overseas Regional Support Center in Cape Town. They're nearby to Mozambique, so they're a ready resource. We've got the trained staffing in place to, uh, to run this facility. We've got contracts in place for, for some of the, the maintenance of the equipment. So, so I'll be watching this one. This might be my favorite in our entire portfolio, if it's okay for me to have a favorite. And uh, I think that's all I've got on the case study. Again, trying to be mindful of time. Be happy to take questions, get some high level comments. Feel free to put something in the Q&A. So don't worry, don't worry about okay. time. Uh, take your time. This is okay. going really wonderfully. There was one question on a return on investment, which I think this is a good time to talk about it because you're talking about all the various measurements. And I would suspect that uh, you're not looking at, you know, a bottom line dollar uh, measurement, but can you address more about uh, your measures of success? I think you did a good job of that. And I actually may defer to that at the end. And when, when Victoria comes back on, uh, since she's more in the real estate portfolio, but how they measure any value of a piece of property that we're going to buy, it, it comes into more into that question. And my view of it is more of how do you, how do you enhance and preserve that investment through, uh, through maintenance and repair and enhancement Excellent. and through sustainment, restoration, and modernization programs that I mentioned. Thank you. So, so Victoria will catch the breadcrumb on that. We'll come back to that at the end. We'll, we'll just uh, talk uh, technology quickly. I'm going to highlight uh, a couple mentioned here, which we call uh, OBO Smart Building Solution and the HoloLens. But, but I also wanted to mention some other things before, before we look at those. Uh, we've already mentioned our GIS housing network, the HNET. That is all taking advantage of of data analytics. We mentioned Builder, so that's taking advantage of software that's available. I also, I wanted to mention, I, I, didn't, I didn't put it in uh, previously in this presentation. The software that is used for us to, to look at our, our project development is one thing. 
how we look at our real property is another thing. We've mentioned our CMMS, which we call GMMS, which is customized and it's very difficult to maintain. We do a very poor job with a commercially available construction management software. And so we're kind of all over the place. And rather than have one priority in the building fight with another with, hey, why don't you use ours? Ours is better. Why don't you like ours? We, we undertook, uh, and it's still underway, in fact, we call it enterprise applications modernization. And a fantastic uh, IRM team at OBO has gone to all of the users and say, what do you need to come out of the software? What does our real property team need to come out of the software to meet federal mandates on reporting? What does our project management people need to come out of the software to do project accountability and reporting that we do to the director on a monthly basis? What does our construction management teams need to collect the right data to manage risk and contingency during construction? And what do we need to collect the data and analyze it and come out of facility management and yet still report back to, to real property, which we report through a different office? How do you do all that? So this effort is, is again, it's called Enterprise Applications Modernization. And they've come through all the user needs. They're making the framework of what they need. Now they're looking at demos. They've not gone in with a predetermined outcome. And it won't necessarily be one package. But data transportability is extremely important. And so on Builder, we decided we, we couldn't adopt Builder until we checked its data transportability so that you can come in and out of that system and communicate with our other systems. But we don't want them to be so specialize and customize that, that they can't be updated and work with other products. So, so that challenge uh, IRM is looking at right now, and I, I can't wait for the outcome. And uh, the other one I wanted to mention, actually, let's go to the next slide, and then I'll mention the next one. We'll, we'll start with the, with the HoloLens. I don't easily embrace technology, if you really get to know me. I, I, I can use it, but it's not my, it's not my first choice to embrace technology. So when I hear about virtual reality, I, I, I you know, I, I've watched Star Trek and I kind of end it there. But when COVID-19 happened and then HoloLens technology is readily accessible, it's approved by the department, and now I have a failure of an elevator going on in Tokyo, what can you do? So we actually used a HoloLens to do uh, some surveys over in, in Tokyo and, and have, have results to show for it. We did a demo, this is the one that convinced me, sorry, you're gonna, you're gonna get my lowest common denominator here. At Christmas a year ago, we had a guy use a HoloLens, we put the recipe up on the device, and he made cupcakes for Christmas. And live, virtually, we got to vote on whether we wanted red sprinkles or green sprinkles. And that's what convinced me that this can really work. To, to see something that near that you could touch it. The guy was in his kitchen baking cupcakes. And virtual cupcakes don't have any calories. But I'll leave the analogy there. What we're doing now is finding other applications to, to, to pay. The, the cost of this kind of technology is easier to pay for in a capital construction projects. So we're actually deploying these, I believe, on eight of our capital projects going now. Other technology we're deploying, we're putting Wi-Fi in some of our field offices so that we can actually access this technology. And that leads me to a group that we put together for our construction facility security management, all three of those offices. We call it uh, CFSM Tech Forward to look at all of the technologies that get us up to speed as fast as possible in construction. And then some of those, then we, then we hand over to, to the facility management office. And so, for example, if we've got drawings on an iPad that you can use access using Bluebeam, for example, why turn over paper to a facility manager? We can actually give the iPad with all of the, the Bluebeam drawings and, and everything on it. So, so we're, we're developing that in CFSM Tech Forward. We, I, I already mentioned, if you're reading about Moscow in the news, we're gonna support that, support them out of our ORSC in Frankfurt. And so we're deploying HoloLens technology over to Moscow so we can have experts in Frankfurt actually see things in real life uh, over in Moscow. Uh, 
So this is an exciting area. I'm absolutely not the expert in it, but I, I 100% believe in the possibility. So that's HoloLens, and let's go to the next one I wanted to highlight in technology. We call OBOS, which is OBO Smart Buildings Solution. I mentioned we are a decentralized facility management platform. Authority is at the mission, is at the embassy. And I've heard great stories of looking at building automation systems and how to tweak the settings and the systems for, for energy savings, when do the lights come on, when is the building occupied? There's all kinds of things you can do, and we do all that all locally with no opportunity for oversight or reviewing that data, or troubleshooting, or that kind of thing. So OBOS will be an attempt to, to collect that data, package that data, somehow send it either to an ORSC or, or headquarters or both and get some oversight, some assistance, again, troubleshooting Q&A uh, and get, get some live feedback on that data. We, we, we're studying the realm of the possible. There are some security concerns on transporting that kind of data. We need the right kind of pathways in place. Is it every system? Well, that's too much to tackle. So we're looking at building automation, power monitoring, and fire alarm systems. Those are the three systems that we're tackling in a pilot. And we're looking at that in Mission Germany. We selected that in part because of COVID-19. Sometimes you couldn't, you couldn't go across a border even in, in, uh, in Europe. But in Germany, we have multiple missions. We have a brand new annex getting ready to come online over at the Clay LA building. We have a new embassy in Berlin that's a couple years old, but it was built to new standards. And then we have the, the Frankfurt consulate. And this is a converted hospital, amazing maze of eclectic systems all thrown together. And so it's perfect for the pilot because you go from kind of new to middle age to old. And what are going to be what what are the challenges going to be to to capture that data and to send it back? We first went through an analysis of alternatives. What's possible? What will our cybersecurity people let us even do? And we, we came up with a system. Let's see if there's anything else I want to say on this slide before I go to the next one. I want something else here. Let, let's go to the next slide. So th this, this is diagrammatic, but all the names of the suppliers on the bottom, we don't prescribe what kind of system that is going to go into a, into a facility. And some of them, the way their outputs come out, they're all different. So how, how do you collect and, and collate all that and then send it back to where it can show up on a dashboard? And in the AOA, they came up with a need for a middleware that helps pull the signals and, and send them back together. So we actually came up with, um, I'm, I'm going to get way out of my depth if I start talking about what it is, but it, we, we did come up with a solution in the analysis of alternatives. And now they're actually in the pilot. Oh, let's, let's go to the next slide. I won't even begin to explain this slide, but I love this slide that shows how all of the, you can see fire, HVAC, utilities, and various things over on the left. How do they run through the controllers, grab the data, put it together, and send it off to, to the dashboard? That this, that's what this is showing. It is possible the survey team was out in Germany week before last, I believe, just had nothing but a good report on what they found. There are some challenges, but they have technical solutions to all of them. So I'm looking forward to it's a fairly short time horizon. But before the end of the year, they'll have the pilot done and see if it worked. And then we can look at a, at a full implementation plan worldwide. One of the goals, an immediate goal is let's just get the data back so someone can see it. But is there a need to control it in, in you know, broadly, broadly, no, we're not going to have like the BAS wizard that sits back and just controls everybody's BASs. We're not going to do that. But there are times when you got to troubleshoot a fire alarm panel and push a software patch. And what do we do? We put a person on a plane, we send them to a post, 
they do the troubleshooting, either they have what they need or they don't, and they push software patches. If we can push software patches remotely and monitor the signal and then, re then, then push the patch, that's a, it's a huge win for us. If there's locations where we have to leave in a hurry, which there are, I've mentioned Moscow a couple of times, we had to evacuate Caracas, we have other places where we've left. If, if you could see some things remotely and kind of figure out what's going on and actually control things, sometimes that has a benefit. So it's not our goal to do that worldwide across every service, but it, it would be a benefit if we could get there. So we're gonna push the boundary on, on what we can do and then we're gonna look at its application uh, post, post to post and look at a worldwide implementation plan. So I wanted to throw that out there on technology and I think that is, that is my technology presentation. I'm happy to answer questions and on that and probably tell you that, <laughs> that I don't know. But as we move into conclusions, um, what I wanted to consider is, let's go to the next. Victoria had this slide up at the at the beginning, and so I wanted to highlight here. We've we've talked about process and people and technology, where we are and how how we can improve and, and the kind of road that we're on. But it's not a an add on. It's absolutely baked into every single thing that we do under our goals for for security. It's to enhance the functionality and facilities of our residences and, and our offices and. And so that's right there in our goal. Industry leading resilient facilities, that's right there in our goals. And then of course, I see a facility management and the great bulk of everything I've talked about today around stewardship, promoting continuous improvement facilitated by a culture of optimizing people, process and supporting technology. So our, our goals absolutely back up where we're headed. And let's go to the next slide. I mentioned that we're right in the process of, of finalizing our functional bureau strategic framework. Goal number two, improve the resilience and maximize lifespan of our facilities. And right in there is where we're measuring FCI, we're performing facility performance evaluations so that we can continue to develop the products that we've talked about. Of course, all of that is supported by, uh, by the right people. And I, Yes, let's go to the last slide then. To position ourselves for success, um, uh, we've already, these are the things that we've talked about, that we're gonna enhance our investment, uh, we're gonna partner with other stakeholders, implementing industry best practices and leveraging technology. We feel like that is setting us up for where we need to be going. And with that, I will invite Victoria back to, to close out, talk about how to stay connected with OBO, and uh, I, I thank you all very much for the invitation and opportunity to present today. Thank you so much, Tracy. And this, this is just a couple of um, uh, opportunities uh, for folks out there to engage with us. We have uh, what I believe is an incredibly robust social media presence. Um, you know, join us, you know, follow us on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. Um, you know, there's, there's an incredible amount of uh, you know, opportunity to hear more about what we're doing, not just in sort of the, the space that we've been discussing today, but, you know, design and, and other types of, uh, of, of topics. So if we can go to the next slide for one second. This just gives you a little bit more of a flavor of the types of things we're doing. Um, take five Fridays, every Friday afternoon uh, on, on LinkedIn. And I think it's also carried on Facebook. Um, we've got someone from OBO who's talking with one of our um, partners, uh, whether it's Mason and Hanger or, um, I, you know, there's, the, there's already been two seasons. We're in the middle of our second season um, on, uh, on Take Five Fridays. So please feel free to, to check any of those out. Um, and, and you can see a little bit more about, <clears throat> you know, Tracy mentioned on the people side, some of the recruiting types of things we're doing, um, you know, really, again, trying to get the word out there, show the breadth and depth of what we're doing, um, really trying to be, um, to, to sort of live up to that um, industry leading, or at least looking at best practices and then and then emulating those. So uh, just some things for, for you to, uh, to think about. And then I think we're, Mike, I will, I'll defer to you, um, 
I could do one thing, which is to, to address that uh, ROI question right at the outset. And then I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, leadership because I think there was a there was a question that someone asked Deb and I and I feel like there's a there's a tie through here. But I guess the question for you, Mike, is did you want to did you want to stop here before we go into question and answer and do you know sort of the, the joint or how do you how do you want to proceed? Please say what you were going to say about leadership. And then I'd like to ask Tracy some things and then we'll go into the general discussion. Great. So so it was really interesting. I, I saw the question, and I think Deb answered it around sort of the, the what's in it for me piece of it, and it gets into change management and culture change. And I think for me, Tracy hit on it when she talked about sort of an evolution to this being how we operate. So right now, there may be initiatives, and we're pursuing something, and we're getting sort of um, emotion and energy around initiatives, but demonstrating and communicating the value proposition um, for the underlying, whether it's a process improvement, whether it's an application, sort of communicating that and then really making that part of our DNA, part of our vernacular, and then moving on as how we do things. Uh, for me, it's it's leaders like Tracy, it's leaders like our other managing directors um, and our, our, uh, our new director who's come in and said, TCO, total cost of ownership is absolutely going to be critical for us. Uh, you know, focusing on what the field needs is absolutely critical for us. And those messages, they start at the top, but they, but they like ice cream, right? They melt and they fill in the cracks and they just absolutely suffuse the entire organization. And so, so for me, it, the, the question, while it may start with leadership, right? Once we've made, uh, we've, we've given the why, once we've demonstrated the value, and once we've um, sort of reaffirmed it, right? I mean, to me, what's great about um, participating in, in uh, sessions like this is we have the opportunity to get feedback. Y'all can say, hey, you're on the right track, or mm, I don't know, we think you got some work to do. That's great feedback because then we carry that back to our teams and we say, hey, we went out, we demonstrated what we were doing and the response was great. Or the response was, you can do better. Or, you know, I, I hope the response won't be you're doing horribly because I, you know, I certainly take a great deal of pride in, in all of the types of things that Tracy's been sharing. So, um, so for me, that's sort of that leadership, that leadership journey. And I think among the things that we've been talking about or sort of the, and I, you know, it might be overused or trite is, but leading from where you sit, you don't have to be a supervisor to sort of understand and embrace some of this technology. You don't have to be a manager um, to be able to communicate uh, to your to, to other teams, sort of the cross functional value um, and, and elements of prioritization. And, and I'll, I'll, go, I'll sort of segue a little bit into that into that ROI discussion. You know, when and I'd like to, here's what I believe when budgets, when there was so much money, right, that it, you know, we didn't have to uh, really drill down on if we're going to do a can we still afford to do B, C, and D? Or, or if not, you know, is it worth giving up A to do B, C, and D? We're now in that space. And so what are those factors we're looking at? When, when we recently um, sought to look at all of our representational facilities, this is uh, ambassadors residences, uh, deputy chief of mission residences, and uh, Marine security guard residences, we looked at things like um, representational stature. Was the, was the goal right, uh, of, of having a symbolism of the United States in that host country, um, you know, what was the value of that? Uh, what about our uh, accessibility issues? Are we role modeling what we want other nations to sort of see from us about accessibility and sort of uh, access of everyone from all walks of life to these facilities? Um, so we looked at a number of things. Obviously, you're gonna have your uh, uh, security, you're gonna have your fire life safety, seismic, all of these things were put into these sort of into the calculus that goes into it. Um, but then there's the squishier stuff I wanna say, which is, you know, are we countering influences in a region? How do we show up as the United States um, not just to make sure that we understand what other actors may be doing, but maybe to, to counteract what they're doing. And, and this, there's this, you know, again, sort of this delicate balance between security and accessibility for some of our public diplomacy spaces. How are you winning the hearts and minds while protecting the people who are, are delivering those messages? So um, 
So I think I rambled a little bit in there. Sorry for all that. But I think I was really trying to get to the. <laughs> no, that was not rambling at all. That is why right. I am so enamored by the work of the U.S. Department of State. Yes, you have to secure people's lives. Yes, you have to have fire safety, all of those things. That is clearly, you know, life, limb, and protection is, is most important. However, you're the Department of State. So part of your mission is diplomacy. And what OVO has done to be, to have their facilities be diplomats in cities is admirable. And what we're trying to show here is it's not just the architectural design that is diplomatic, but it is the processes. And the fact that um, uh, Bureau of Administration is using ISO 55,000, which is just really starting to take off globally. You can be a leader in showing how to use that. And because of your past presentations, um, we know how in the nuts and bolts of how you're visualizing your information and managing your information as Tracy was showing from the planning stage all the way through to disposal, that we would love to help you use that as a diplomatic, uh, uh, not weapon, but a diplomatic aid and here's my thought. If the Department of State pays ISO to make ISO 55,000 available to everyone in the world, that would be one of the best diplomatic moves you could make. But we'll talk about that offline. So um, Tracy, uh, what a wonderful uh, detailed presentation because uh, so, much, uh, uh, so many times we're talking at high levels. And I really appreciate you showing how cupcake diplomacy is able to break down um, human nature resistance to change. I like to say improvement, never use the word change, say improvement. And that cupcake exercise helped you end up doing a better elevator repair in Japan. And now, you know, leadership culture has been influenced and uh, you can maybe start seeing how to apply that. Actually, your last slides showing how to be able to be remote to handle thing was really uh, addressed that also. So thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, so uh, just another comment. I cracked up when you said a new definition of headshot. That was very funny. So we didn't see your face, but your outfit was diplomatically spectacular. So uh, <laughs> kudos for that. Um, so um, I noticed the uh, Right, so the detail of information, but the presentation of the information was spectacular also. And Admiral Allen started off uh, saying many things, but one of the things he was saying was talking about how to present to leadership to help them make better decisions. And I think that your slides demonstrated how that's possible. I don't know how much you do use that for uh, informing leadership and helping them make decisions, but. Uh, just spectacular graphics. And that, um, do you use that to help uh, leadership? Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, we do. And a huge shout out to our external affairs team who, who assist in putting these things together. And so, so the messaging, we're able to shape it. I mean, this is a technical audience here. So I've put in some, some technical jargon I, uh, appropriate. This was, this was what we wanted to hear. But there's other times when, when you need to get the message, and I loved what you said, that our facilities are part of our diplomacy. And so, for example, I haven't seen it yet, but staying with Maputo, uh, I, I can't wait for us to publish our monograph. And we publish those now for the design of a facility and, and when it's completed. And it's the, it's the imagery, and it helps tell the story. And how did you get here? And it's, it's a lasting public diplomacy tool that our missions use and, and give away and talk about. I mentioned the art program. They have fantastic publications as well that tell the story of the art that went into some of our facilities. And so that um, I mentioned I, I had been in Islamabad, Pakistan. And to me, that facility set the standard for excellence in facility management. It was a multi-phase project. It was phase one and phase two. And actually it was a phase three. But when we were transitioning, I was, a, I was part of phase two. 
a message that I gave to senior management to include the ambassador was when, when my team leaves construction, people aren't going to go there and say, oh, well, I'm over on phase two. Where are you? I'm over on phase one. No, it's one facility. And the facility management team had done such a good job on the phase one for the years that we were finishing the other phases. You couldn't tell the difference. When we were done, it was all clean. It was all well maintained. There was one BAS control room. And so that's facilities being the diplomacy that when you walk on a compound like that, you, you can just see how, how well it's maintained and operated. And, and the, the community is, is comfortable. You need the HVAC, you need the BAS, you need security systems, you need it all but you need it to not scream at you. You need it to just, you need to feel comfortable and know that you're being protected when you're doing your work, so. Yeah, and uh, the images included uh, a really good, I think it's a, a building information model image of the uh, window being installed with the machine and the people, and it showed how you could do replacement. Is that from building a building information model do you know or is that just a graphic it's probably that one is probably just a graphic but we are adopting uh, building information management systems i didn't talk about that uh, too much today but we're, we're actually adopting those in our in our design and construction as well uh, we've had presentations on that in the past and if there's any uh, evolution and development of that please uh, come back and, and share that uh, with us certainly that there's probably an opportunity to look at how we, again, capture some of the as built and then pass it over when it's being, when the facility is being operated, you want to take advantage of all the data that you have. Yeah, um, because I've been following this, and as I said, I'm an asset management geek, I know that that uh, is part of what uh, Admiral Allen had been, had started, and it's a compo uh, compartment, uh, components uh, approach to design where you have information about the uh, assets and then that that information can be maintained throughout the life cycle of the of the building so uh, uh, we applaud uh, the efforts you're, you're making there also so um, I think uh, now if we could ask uh, Deborah and Keith if uh, they're available still to uh, join us um, while they're coming on uh, uh, a little personal note, my father was uh, is a retired colonel. He served as a uh, Marine Engineering Battalion commander in uh, Vietnam. And he told me, war is only the failure of diplomacy. And so I made it my goal right then to make sure diplomacy never fails. Sounds like he's read his classowets. <laughs> yes, he has a degree in philosophy and uh, military uh, strategy also. But anyway, um, I applaud the efforts that you're doing uh, to uh, make sure that diplomacy never fails. And uh, I'm curious, did any of you learn anything from the presentations um, of each other? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I hadn't gotten a good deep dive into uh, what Obo is doing on the um, personal property side, which was really great to see. Uh, that's uh, that's terrific. I would love to be able to. I mean, of course, most of the facilities that we get, we're not building from ground up. Right. So we don't get to start from scratch. Uh, but when we do acquire buildings, uh, obviously, we have to build that from scratch. And so it's great to see that. Uh, and I really like the leading practices slides, Tracy. Those were terrific. I want to grab your slide set so that I can study it afterwards. Cer certainly, uh, you're most welcome. I, and I guess um, my background, I, I was a, a, well, I am a foreign service construction engineer. I've been a project director. I love construction. And yet to be the managing director now also for facility management, we my lens has changed that it's not just this is what we do after construction we have legacy facilities and those have to be studied evaluated prioritized maintained capitalized all the things that we have to do and that's not just a new construction lens that's through what do you do with existing facilities so. right that's where the total cost of ownership concept really comes in to play very strongly right because the initial capital investment it, you know gets a splash because it is large but then over the rest of the life cycle 
all the, the maintenance and repair and recapitalization uh, completely eclipses that you know tip of the iceberg capital cost. Right, and and recent exchanges we've had with our congressional stakeholders, I appreciate that they're asking the question about our our spending on maintenance and repair because I think models of politicians, if I can call them, public leaders, let me say that, um, they, they care about the big splash and how much money you're giving for new construction, but they don't always look and see what's it going to cost to maintain that. So I very much appreciate that our congressional stakeholders are looking at that and that they'll be open to that discussion when we say this is how we're going to shift to, to, to preserve, enhance, and protect the, the investment through stewardship. So that kind of leads into the ROI question. So Victoria, if you want to uh, talk about ROI. Yeah, and I think it's this one's a little bit more difficult to get at because obviously when you're you know, in a, in a straight real estate perspective, okay, you know, are, are we meeting our targets in terms of uh, a return, you know, internal rate of return? Are we meeting our targets in terms of reconciled uh, estimate of value? How are we doing in terms of appraisals? I mean, some of the challenges, I mean, I'm, I'm perhaps slightly envious um, of Deb and her team in, in the sense of sort of the, the transparency and availability of information that's reliable um, in the markets that she serves versus the markets that we serve. Whereas, you know, for example, uh, we're, we're dealing with a, a acquisition of a plot of land in, in Kazakhstan. And you know, all land is held by you know one or two banks, and you know there's a there's a, a, a strong connection between the banks and the you know and the central government. And so, yeah, sure, get get an appraisal, fair market value. What is fair market value, right? I mean, it's willing buyer, willing seller. So uh, I suppose in that sense, uh, you know, you you can you can come to a conclusion of that. But um, but then you know, sort of these decisions that we have to make. Um, that we are going to ultimately be required to make. For example, we're when you look at a new post opening um, or a new any kind of new presence anywhere, and and I, I think we are probably taking some uh, appropriate criticism for the fact that we're not particularly agile right now. It takes us, I would say, on order of two years to identify, evaluate, and and get a site for uh, new future uh, new construction under contract, then a couple more years to design, a couple more years to construct, you're looking at 10 years. And so, you know, if you need to be nimble in a region where there's, you know, sort of a pop-up presence and you need to be there to address it, but it may not linger, um, we don't we don't have that framework. We don't have that kind of agility. Um, so, so what's the opportunity cost Right of pursuing our methodology the way that we, uh, you know, that we know it and the way that we love it and are good at it. Right, um, you know, how, how can we uh, be comfortable with understanding what the opportunity cost is when we're missing out on some of those, you know, opportunities to, to be to be more nimble, to be more agile. Yeah, I mean, Obo has a couple, a, a number of really complicated. Um, aspects of trying to get data because of your international, you know, I mean, just looking at the sustainability question of energy costs, right? I know we've been doing uh, parallel efforts to try to capture utility costs, right? For me, I've got facilities nationwide, all the energy bills can go to one uh, point of contact, they can pay those points of contact, you all have some different arrangements with the posts, but even if you were paying all the energy bills, you've got different languages, you've got different currencies, right? Just trying to capture that data is so tremendously difficult for you. Uh, it's, it's really a challenge. I mean, I would also say that when we're looking at the question of return on investment at the federal, you know, in terms of federal real property, it's less about return on investment and more what I would say value on investment, mm -hmm. right? Because we're never, I mean, truly, we're never gonna get return on investment um, in the traditional sense of that, but we have to look at how the particular real property assets that we are commissioning are gonna provide us value to our mission over the life cycle, which is a slightly more difficult thing to quantify. 
And you stated that very well. And one of the beauties of uh, ISO 55000 is it has a section that requires um, organizations to establish their measurement parameters. And they don't say mm -hmm. return on investment. They say you determine what your measurement is and then right. hold yourself accountable to it. I mean, real common sense and simple, but to have that in a single document is really uh, wonderful. And I, I would add that it, it has to do with value preservation as well. Um, so you, you can't let your stuff deteriorate to the point that you're continuing to sink money into something when you could do value preservation through some of the programs we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of sustainability, sometimes it costs more to get that value than we would pay if we were using traditional energy sources or traditional you know design standards and so forth so there's a value there that is kind of one of those intangibles that you were talking about mike how much is the government willing to pay you need green to go green right is how we put it sometimes <laughs> right um and uh oh, lost my train of thought there uh there was um Oh, it's been uh, it's been a long presentation. I'm not afraid to say I've lost my train of thought on that. Uh, um, Keith, um, can you make any comments? I had muted you, so uh, you'd have to unmute yourself. Uh, muting is always a good idea for me. Um, what what I would say is I have the uh, I have the I'm in a fortunate position that I've you know worked overseas, worked for Obo, and worked here. So. Um, I get to kind of see all of it. So when I listen to Tracy's uh, presentation and what Victoria's saying, you know, I'm, th I'm just so thrilled to see it uh, and uh, what Deborah and our team are trying to do domestically. The, you know, the secret is that the secret is, is that we're doing the same thing overseas that we're doing here, right? I mean, that's the fundamental thing. And, and, and while we kind of treated it differently organizationally over the years, it really is the same thing. So what I see going forward is the department really partnering more together to you know, tackle the incredible challenges that we have all the way around the world. And I think for us being kind of the, the, small, the small guys, I, I wanna know where Oboe gets their money and see where if we can uh, you know, come up with a better way of, uh, of siphoning or something. But um, <laughs> you know, kind of a lot of times ride on their coattails on a lot of stuff they already have established in, including uh, industry outreach. So um, it's, it's, it's really all about all of us working together, learning from each other, uh, not being afraid to try things, um, and, uh, and that continuous improvement, right? Um, I mean, Tracy outlined so many wonderful uh, programs and initiatives that Obo's doing, and it's so heartwarming to hear because that has not always been the case, right? And there's been much more focus on designing stuff and constructing, not on measuring how it's performing. And, and that is really what it is supposed to be about, right? These, these, uh, the physical infrastructure, how it continues to support our mission for decades, right? You know, it's not just one year after ribbon cutting. So it kind of see where, where Obo's going, where we're trying to go. It's the same place, right? It really is the same place. We had a presentation from the government accountability office on Monday, uh, which was really spectacular. And part of what they're talking about is uh, establishing uh, a federal capital fund. Uh, I guess that's similar to what OBO has and what uh, Bureau of Administration is looking into because uh, we can't do our best if we're hamstrung by bureaucratic procedures and the bureaucracy needs to constantly improve also. So I'm, I was very happy that GAO is uh, advocating a solution to be able to go beyond the year by year uh, approach and uh, glad to see that the OBO has that and uh, Bureau of Administration is looking into it. Um, now we just got to see if the federal government can uh, uh, go to a, a more international accounting, uh, accrual accounting instead of having the separate books. Anyway, that's a much longer uh, uh, discussion than we have here. Um, so what I had forgotten about, that's that's the, the thing that I had uh, lost my train of thought on. So uh, I came back to that. Also, uh, Amelia Sakoy uh, from GAO says that she's gonna reach out to Deborah and Keith. I don't know if you saw that, in, uh, but she was watching. And uh, so there is this uh, uh, communication going on between the agencies. Um, and uh, is there 
anything else that uh, anybody wanted to uh, add? This has been uh, so rich and wonderful. Uh, don't want to keep you any longer. I understand the, the dedication of time for this. It's quite the honor for you to be uh, presenting. I don't want to keep you any longer than necessary. Mike, it, it looks like one of your attendees has a hand up. I, I, I don't know if it's possible to uh, unmute that part. Carol? Let me look into that. And since you asked, uh, Nick, will you- uh, in her hand whoever it was. Oh, <laughs> oh what you got? Maybe she was stretching was like, oh, yep. electronically. Yeah. Um, there, 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 I think we addressed the question about uh, BIM that had come in and uh, that's being connected. And everything was so thorough. Usually I can go on and on with questions, but like I said, I don't want to uh, keep you any longer than you've already uh, been generous with your time. So, uh, I'll, well, we I, certainly I, appreciate I'll, the opportunity to spend time with you, with your community, um, and with each other. I mean, this is a this is a true. Uh, it, you know, I think Keith used the word blessing, and I would agree with that. And, and, and the ability to hear, you don't get to always have the time to hear what sister organizations are doing, and sort of really mutually reinforce the good work that's going on. So I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Thanks very much. All right. So, and thanks to our audience. And uh, uh, thank you to our uh, patron sponsors and our organizational members. We do not need to show the slide on that. We'll fix that in post. Um, and we look forward to uh, uh, doing anything we can to uh, help you with your very uh, important mission. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, thank you everybody. very much. Great to see everyone. Take, so Take care.